Turns out Mother Nature can be a real bee. Let's get this shed actually waterproof and begin the process of installing the metal roof. I can honestly say there was blood, sweat, and tears shed for this, well, shed. Come along for the ride as I continue to chip away at progress towards my camp house shed vision. Now this may come as a shock to most of you, but I have no idea how to put a roof on. I mean, just look at the mess I made with the underlayment. This is the aftermath after the rain came through and like a dummy, didn't know that I had to nail the bottom of the underlayment because I thought, well, if I nail there, then water's gonna get in there and it's gonna be a leak path. Well, let me tell you what a bigger leak path is when the whole damn sheet flaps up. So yeah, that means about half our roof got wet overnight, which is not ideal, but it's gonna be okay. We have two days of dry weather and then we got rain again this weekend. So I'm in yet another mad dash to beat that rain by putting the full roof on. So I would say the first thing we need to do is get up there and fix the underlayment and do all the flashing, but so slippery. It is slickered and snot still up there. It's still pretty wet, so I'm gonna let that dry off. In the meantime, let's, uh, let's work on wrapping the sides. Ever have one of those days where getting started just seems to take a bit longer? Yeah. After taming the roll of Tyvek, I got to work wrapping the shed starting from the bottom. Now I'm using a three foot wide roll because I'm doing this alone, but the standard nine foot roll would make quick work of this little shed if I had a helper. Speaking of a helper, here's a great tip for working alone with house wrap. Get yourself an extendable paint pole and then slide the roll over top so it can spin freely. Then use it as kind of a helping hand to keep the roll elevated as you go higher on your structure. I saw this in a video here on YouTube and I just thought it was genius. You can even use a clamp as a stop to get the roll position at just the right height too. You know, sometimes it's the simple things. And yes, if you're wondering, before I get that third row of wrap up, I'm gonna cut those windows out, unlike in the last video where I forgot. And in keeping with tradition, going overboard with accuracy on these three transom window openings by finishing the cut with a templating bit in my router. And on the third pass, as I make my way around the shed, of course, the roll runs out with about eight feet left to go. Because of course, why wouldn't it? Now moving on to taping the seams with Tyvek tape. It's worth noting that I'm leaving the bottom edge of the wrap open to allow for any drainage. I think that's what you're supposed to do. All right, so we've got all the lower sides wrapped and taped, so that is waterproof as of right now. And the roof has been baking under the sun all day, so all that water should be gone. So let's get up on the roof and fix the underlayment and add more nails. Now I'm also gonna use these plastic cap nails, which frankly I should have used from the beginning, but we're all learning, right? My original reason for not using these cap nails was one, the shortest length they came in was one inch. So I weirdly worried about seeing the nails from inside the shed when you look up, but I mean, who cares? And two, I thought the bubble top would make the metal roof panels not sit flush on the roof itself, which now I know is kind of ridiculous. Moral of the story here, just use the damn cap nails from the beginning. With that done, I can now trim off the excess underlayment which I left in my first attempt. I'm pretty sure leaving it long was a net negative in keeping the roof dry. It just helped create more ways for the wind to blow it around. Now to seal up all the edges of the roof, I'm busting out more of the flashing tape. I'm guessing this isn't really necessary, but I wasn't sure how long this would be exposed before I can get the roof on. So I figured if anything, it would just give me some peace of mind in the meantime. Then I knocked out a couple of lingering to-do items, like finally cutting out the window openings on this transom dormer and trimming down the long subfascia boards on each end of the back wall of the shed. Now moving on to the upper sections of each end wall. I started by flashing the underlayment to the OSB face. Probably another belt and suspenders move, to be honest, but no one likes their pants falling down in the rain. Now that is what I call buttoned up. I feel a lot better about a rainstorm hitting this thing than the previous attempt with the uh, underlayment flapping everywhere. Nothing on here is moving. As far as I'm concerned, we can get a downpour. I'd be okay with it. Speaking of which, I think we've got more rain in the forecast. So if we have good weather, we'll get out here and start putting the roof on. If not, we'll have to weather the storm and then get back to it once the rain leaves. 
Well, sure enough, we did get some rain, probably about a day and a half actually. But based on how everything looks, it looks like our waterproofing efforts fared just a little bit better than our first time around. But now that we've got good weather on the forecast, what do you say we get that roof on? Now, as I mentioned at the end of the last video, I'm putting on a metal roof, which I definitely have no idea how to do. But I've watched so many videos that I'm full of false confidence and I think I can do it. But I think the first thing that I need to do is actually put up the fascia boards around the perimeter of all the areas that I'm roofing just so that all the trim can kind of overlap. And for that fascia trim, I'm gonna be using PVC. So I've got a bunch of one by sixes. I've even pre-painted some for the big tall gable sections because I just figured it'd be easier to paint them now rather than later. But let's get all this stuff cut to size and put it around the edges so that we can start on the roof. Now you're gonna think I'm lying, but I literally lost sleep thinking about this step. Do I put up fascia board before or after the roof? How would the drip edge fit? What about the gable trim? How would I paint it? I eventually just decided that putting it up ahead of the roof made the most sense. I'm using some trim screws made specifically for PVC. They not only have a small head, but also have these weird reverse threads near the top to prevent bulging and deforming the trim. Who knew things like this existed? And remember my fascia insomnia? Well, I also convinced myself that painting the fascia trim first made the most sense, since the drip edge and the side gable trim overlapped it. And I was just adamant of the fact that painting it afterwards would lead to a sloppy look. So here we are. And I'll go more into what colors and finishes we're using in a later video in case you're curious. I then basically repeated that step for all of the roof edge trim, but not the side trim, since I was mostly focusing on putting on the drip edge first. Now for this long front porch edge, I just split it up into two sections of 12 foot boards. So I added a 22 and a half degree miter to the mating joint to help hide the seam. I was also told that you should apply some PVC cement to keep the seams from coming apart. So I was a good boy and did that too, but then royally screwed it up as I tried to shimmy the trim board over. All right, it's currently the next morning because of course that took way longer than I thought it would. But now that we've got all the fascia up and we got one coat of paint on it, we can start putting on the first step of the roof, which is the drip edge. And because I'm a roofing newbie, I'm gonna start off on these little overhangs on each side of the shed. Now yesterday I went ahead and put in the drip edge on this side, pretty straightforward. Just gets kind of sandwiched between that fascia board and the underlayment on top. But I figured I'd start on these small little roof pieces because it's frankly probably a lot easier to work with the little metal pieces that are on here rather than on the big roof. And I can make all my screw ups here so that I can learn and hopefully not do it on the big one. That's the plan anyways. So each of those little overhangs have 24 inch panels that are going to sit on top. And now these panels come in standard widths, which is 36 inches. And unless your roof is in equal increments of 36 inches, you are going to have to cut this stuff down. But as I'm making these cuts, I have to remember that these panels are not symmetrical. You can see that where they overlap, this geometry here is different than that geometry. So this is always on one side of the panel. So I can't be cutting and then flipping stuff around because I'm going to end up with bad joints. And to cut this stuff down, the recommended methods are tin snips or shears or power shears. Now, I went and bought this really cheap power shear off Amazon. It was like 45 bucks. I figured I'm probably not going to need it after this, but hopefully this should save my hands, especially when I'm ripping down the big long pieces. Now, if, God forbid, I got the length measurements wrong, which I hope I don't play that back in slow motion in black and white because that means I did. A common way I've seen them cut those down is with a cutoff wheel and an angle grinder. And then you got exposed metal you got to worry about protecting from rust and tucking up underneath flashing and I don't know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Now, as I'm laying this stuff out, I gotta remember that I have a little bit more wiggle room than I think because on each end or edge of the roof, this gable trim kind of covers this up. And all that's really needed is for one of these ridges to be underneath this cavity here. So really I've got three to four inches even to play with on each end that this trim is gonna hide anyways. So I gotta make sure to take that into account when I'm making my cuts. Taking your time to lay out and even pre-drill your mounting holes is just one small detail that'll separate a great looking roof with straight fastener lines against a not so great looking roof. So based on what I've gathered, there are a couple of key ingredients to a metal roof. First, the panels themselves, obviously, but those are sealed at the ends with closures, which are foam pieces cut to the profile shape of the panels. And then the other side edges or joints between other metal roof components are sealed with butyl tape. And then finally, you have the various trim and flashing types to seal off, transition, or otherwise finish the roof. Getting all of those in place in the correct order are kind of table stakes for a successful metal roof installation.
All right, so I'm pretty glad that I did a trial run on that little part of the roof because there's lots of things I learned not to do, and then a couple things that I will definitely keep doing when I do the bigger sections. And the first thing that I'm gonna do a little bit better with is measuring. I laid out all these panels thinking I nailed the reveal on each side so that the gable trim would work, and I put it up there and it didn't, but I need to go back and figure out why so I don't do that again. I was able to make it work by kind of shimming everything back down, and one side of the trim technically doesn't have one of those peaks underneath it, which you're supposed to have, but it's okay. But one thing that I did that actually was really helpful was when you're laying out the panels, just put in one screw at the top, and it kind of allows it to pivot a little bit, which lets you kind of do fine adjustments, making sure that bottom edge on the end of the roof is perfectly straight. I saw that in one of the hundreds of roofing videos I've been watching, and sure enough, it was a very helpful tip. Adding to another in the don't do category would be uh, not to wear gloves. I definitely need to wear gloves. My hands are scraped and beat up after doing the, just that little section of roof. So gloves are absolutely necessary here. Now when it came to the trim, this is a part that I was kind of worried about the most because it's what you see when you look at the structure. It's what makes something either look really nice or kind of crappy. So I started by doing the gable end trim on each end. I did the right hand side first that had the kind of screw up of not enough material on that side. And one extremely vital tool is this little locking T-square that lets me reference from the exact angle of the rafter that I'm making the trim for and then I can just transfer that to the piece of trim. That came in super helpful. And when it came to actually cutting the trim, I found that tin snips were actually a little bit harder to use, at least for me, and this big pair of shears that I have seemed to work the best. It gave me the cleanest cuts, it was the easiest to use, and allowed me to make really accurate cuts on the lines that I'm drawing. Now when it came to putting on the closures underneath the end of the roof, I elected to try it with just that one screw in each panel, so I can just kind of lift it up, tuck it in there, and then peel off the adhesive backing. I don't know that I'm gonna do this again for two reasons. One, it's just kind of hard to get it lined up and perfect. And two, I wasn't able to put sealant on top of those closure strips, which you should do, I'm told. So when I do the rest of the panels, I'm gonna make sure to put a bead of caulking on the top of all those closures before I put the panels on to really seal everything in place. And the final learning is the screw locations at the bottom of each panel. Now based on what I'm reading, you should put more screws on the bottom because this is where the wind is really gonna try and lift up the edge of the roof, so you need a bunch of reinforcement. But I chose to put mine back about two inches from where that foam closure strip was, and it kinda caused the roof to get deformed a little bit and kinda kick out at the end. It's really not that noticeable, but I think a better way to do it would be to either do it through the closure or just behind the closure. Whew. Okay, so with all that education out of the way, let's move on to the other sections of the roof. But first, I have a question. Do you like listening to music when you're working? Well, let me tell you about the Motion Boom Plus, the sponsor of today's video. You see, anytime I'm working around the shop or doing a project like this outside, I like listening to music. It just kind of makes the time go by faster. But there are two features about a speaker system that I don't want to worry about when I'm working. And the first one is battery life. With up to 20 hours of playback time, you don't have to worry about this thing running out of batteries right as you're mid-build. And one of my favorite features actually is to use that big battery to charge other things like your cell phone. I seem to always need to charge my phone when I'm in the shop or working outside, so having that ability is really cool. And the second is I don't have to worry about this thing getting wet. This thing is not just water resistant, it's fully waterproof and buoyant, meaning it floats. So as you know, we're putting on the roof to make this thing waterproof, but it's been raining the past couple days. And one of those times I actually left this thing outside and it was totally fine. That's why this Motion Boom Plus speaker is perfectly at home at a job site, a campsite, on the lake, at the beach, you name it. And with 80 watts of power, including dual 30 watt titanium subwoofers, it is plenty loud and sounds great. Even when you're enjoying this outside, maybe by the pool or at the beach. And if that's not enough, you can use PartyCast 2.0 and link a bunch of these together. And I personally really like the form factor. It just kind of brings you back to the old boombox days. Kind of just makes you want to put it on your shoulder and walk around. So if you're looking for a killer outdoor speaker that's just as at home at a job site as it is a beach, check out the Soundcore Motion Boom Plus. I'll leave a link down in the description where you can go buy one. Thank you to Soundcore for sponsoring this video and let's get back on the roof. To start the roofing on the front porch, step one was again to install the drip edge. And I am actually pretty glad I did a first coat of paint because painting right up to this drip edge without making it look sloppy would have been kind of tricky. Also, another shout out to the little handheld blower coming in handy cleaning off the roof prior to laying panels down. I have used this tool way more than I thought I would. Well, rather predictably, I made the porch a little bit too short. So the stock panels that I ordered, which are 45 inches in length, overhang by three inches, which is technically okay. It's just not the look I want for the front of the shed. Everything else I'd planned for like a one inch overhang. So now I have to trim them to fit. So they only have a one inch overhang. You can see I've got all the 45 inch panels stacked and lined up on the edge, making sure to keep track of which side is the overlap versus the underlap. And then I marked off two inches and now I'm gonna 
So here's the good news. The absolute accuracy or even look of this cut isn't really gonna matter because there's gonna be a transition piece that comes over this edge. Now I could just cut every one of these individually with some tin snips, but I'd have forearms like Popeye by the end of the day. So I think what I'm gonna do is get all these lined up, hope that they don't move and rip them down with a cutoff wheel of my angle grinder. And with all of my PPE on, all that's left to it is to do it. After getting the newly cut panels in place, I applied my learnings from the small roof section we already did and applied it to this porch roof. That includes applying silicone sealant to all of the closures, pre-drilling fastener holes and getting the roof edge fasteners close to the closure locations, and applying butyl tape to all overlapping seams, even between panels. Something that keeps happening to me on this roofing portion is I severely underestimate how much time it takes to actually do it. And I should know this because I've never done it, so I kind of have to figure it all out as I go. But yesterday afternoon, we got the whole porch done, and I was able to get the transition flashing up, which is going to provide that seamless transition from the roof pitch to the porch pitch. And today, we'll continue putting panels on the front half of the roof on either side of the dormer. However, up to this point, I think I've done a really good job of ordering the roofing materials. I got all the right number of panels, the right number of flashings, ridge caps, everything. I don't have anything extra and more importantly I didn't under order anything except for screws and closures. Now the type of screws I'm using are not only color matched to the panels that I'm using but they're also kind of a unique head and drive design that I can't seem to find anywhere else and of course they have a two-week lead time. I also did not order enough closures specifically whichever one this is. I can't remember if it's inside or outside and I'm kicking myself because these things are not expensive. I just didn't understand how many I would need with all the different kind of flashings that I had and of course these are also a two week lead time. And I've searched high and low for replacements and can't seem to find what I need. So though I've already ordered that stuff and it's on its way, I'm not gonna be able to get the entire roof on. So let's go do as much as we can. Here we are finally dealing with some of the larger roof panels and sure enough, it definitely makes it a bit harder. But all of the same principles apply, just at more precarious spots and angles on the roof. Here's a good angle showing how the transition flashing works. The upper roof panel overhangs the top and the flashing then goes over the panel below it, creating a clear water path down the roof. Now how about we go over some costs? I ordered the roofing all together as a package and had it delivered, which costs, get ready, $1,999. That is even the net cost after returning the trim boxes and pallets for a refund. Next up was PVC trim, which was another ridiculous total of $458. Then came miscellaneous, which is mostly paint, Tyvek wrap, and flashing tape. That total was $300. And finally, fasteners, including the screws that I have on order, which came to a total of $185. That all adds up to $2,642 for the roofing portion of this build, bringing our running project total to an eye-watering $8,774. Getting back to the roof, something I haven't mentioned yet is to not use an impact driver with these screws. They have a ceiling washer below the head that cannot be over-tightened. I'm using a drill with the clutch set to a really low setting, preventing me from over-torquing these screws. And then obviously just did the exact same thing on the opposite side of the dormer. One other thing I did off camera is I added these thin cutoffs of the panels along the transition flashing, which will then tie into the end wall flashing up against the front face of the dormer. It'll all make sense later, hopefully. And finally, both sides of the dormer will also get sidewall flashing here. Who knew there were so many dang flashings? And with that, I'm calling this a wrap. No pun intended. Okay, maybe some pun intended. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me through these trials and tribulations of metal roofing madness. Though progress is paused on the roof itself until my materials come in, there's still plenty left to do, like windows, doors, siding, and a fire pit. Also, if you actually wanna learn from somebody who knows what they're doing when it comes to metal roofing, check out Kyle at RR Buildings YouTube channel. They have tons of great content on metal roofing, siding, and general construction. Smash that like button if you're enjoying this build. Get subscribed if you're not already and buckle up for more mediocre construction content. I will see you guys in the next one and until then keep pursuing shed greatness.